another political election in the U.S. you are going to be seeing the word, Antichrist, thrown around a lot again. It will be hurled at various political opponents, or foreign policy affairs, during the upcoming election season, as is virtually always now, commonly the case. We apologize to all non-Christians, for the spectacle you will inevitably, and once again, be forced to endure, during this time. But it is only fair, that you as a member of the general public, be informed, as to what this counter-reformation theology, is actually designed, to hide from you. The real identity of the Antichrist is not confusing. But it is very embarrassing. Especially to what is called mainstream Christianity, today, and that is precisely why, they work so hard to hide it from you. This video has been prepared to inform the public, as to the actual cause, for this inevitable public comedic episode, and to assure you, that what they are hiding, is actually more serious and dangerous to the public welfare, than the comical antichrist claims they will provide you in exchange. All of the information you will be shown is public. It is verifiable. It has a very long history, of being very well known, especially among the counter-reformationists that now dominate the religious landscape of America, who also put on this comedic Antichrist act, every year, for your political entertainment. The Antichrist for Dummies, has been prepared as a basic primer on what the counter-reformation is attempting to hide through this activity, and to give innocent Christians and outside secular observers, a better understanding of what is driving this misled effort among these people in America. And now, the Antichrist for Dummies. The identity of the Antichrist in the Bible is very easy to know. It is not confusing. It is so obvious that it must be confused on purpose. In order to keep people from finding out. But there are some basic common sense rules that you must logically follow. When thinking about the Antichrist. Number 1. Do not ask someone who follows the Antichrist. Who the Antichrist is. They will tell you a lie. This seems to be a very simple rule. But you would be surprised how difficult this is for most people to follow. If you ask a Nazi about the Holocaust, they will be very happy to explain that it never happened. And then they will follow that speech with telling you how all Jews should be exterminated. So it is fairly easy to spot their lie. Well, the same thing is true about the Antichrist. They will tell you that who they follow is not the Antichrist. And then explain even if he is you should still follow him anyway. So it is very easy to spot the lie. Number 2. The identity of the Antichrist is already defined by the primary source documentation that coined the term. That would be the New Testament. Not what some preacher or religious leader claims. Making up things to be the Antichrist is a bad idea. You may not like your third grade teacher, but that doesn't make him or her the Antichrist. The Bible never defined the Antichrist as whatever you don't like at the moment. The Antichrist is never presented as being thought of as the most evil person on earth. In fact, the Bible says quite the opposite about the Antichrist. It is someone very well thought of. So demonizing political opponents or world dictators or tyrants, no matter how bad they may be, are simply not the Antichrist. Number 3. Respect the contents of the biblical text. People who specialize in hiding the Antichrist and manipulating them for political or commercial purposes with this term 
always twist and eventually violate the clear content of biblical texts in order to force their substitutes into these prophecies. If you do not respect the factual details of the text itself, written by those who defined this term, then you will end up talking about something they never mentioned, and you will end up deceived and exploited. Okay. Now that we have gone over three basic ground rules, we are now ready to review the Biblical Antichrist for dummies. These will be very simple ways to know how to spot an intentional deceiver when it comes to the subject of the Antichrist. They are a group of international elitists. The Mahdi will be a messianic figure. He will be a descendant of Muhammad. Three senators who heard about this, uh, one of them was a kind of a liberal who said, boy, that sounds too much like the book of Revelation. Um, the Antichrist is not a man. Now it starts with a triangular shape, which is probably Illuminati in nature or Masonic. 2009 in the month of May, and the gentleman said, I've got to tell you this period that's just happened to me that's freaked me out. I just flew on a plane with a man who is in a, a, on the board of the American Medical Association. He will be an unparalleled, unequal leader. He will come out of a crisis of turmoil. He will take control of the world. He will establish a new world order. And there's no doubt that uh, Conchita versed is made to look like a woman, but wearing that beard, he also looks like Jesus. Obama is the closest to the devil of any president we've ever had. If you look at the characteristics of the devil. <laughs> know that there is the availability now that starting uh, it could start in 2014 but by 2017 is to have everybody do away with all everybody's health care put you on government health care put a chip it's called a health care chip could you be an image of the false Jesus in other words the antichrist <laughs> www.com. Now it was noted, and I noted this immediately, that in the Hebrew language, the W is a vowel because a vowel uh, can be a V or a vowel in the Hebrew language. He will destroy all who resist him. He will invade many nations. He will make a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews. <laughs> for the creation of one world religion. Back then they visited 
Ancient Egypt, the pyramids. That's where all of that technology came from. But the 20th century will join the counter church because it claims to be when its visible head speaks ex cathedra from Moscow on the subject of economics and politics. Do you know what he told me? He said we got in the conversation. I mean, he's not a Christian. He said that the Obama administration was going to force health care in because they had a trick that's going to be put in the right hand or the forehead of everybody taking the health care system. And the Bilderberg Group. These 200 or so wicked spirits who came here and you know, Do you have a cell phone? And as Chief Shepherd of World Communism. Oddly enough, the Vav is a is a numerical value in Gematria in Hebrew. I believe the other Vav is six. So, if you have the World Wide Web, go ahead, guys. You translate it to the Hebrew language. Guess what it is? It's simply six six six. He will rule for seven years, establish Islam as the only religion. He will come on a white horse with supernatural power. He will be loved by all people on earth. <laughs> Maybe you have a Samsung? Do you have a tablet? And others like this have been working feverishly behind the scenes. They are the very exact same ones who are imprisoned currently in the bottomless pit. <laughs> um, in the taken from JC communism and the conscience of the West. Because the letter Vav is a letter of six in number value of the Hebrew alphabet. Do you have a PlayStation? Do you have a Nintendo? Do you have a Nintendo DS? Maybe a Chinese If that sounds familiar, that is a precise description of the biblical Antichrist. For many, many decades, seeking to bring about a one-world government. Do you have GPS? Is one of your cars those cars that have OnStar? Uh, when the World Wide Web came into existence, the World Wide Web was abbreviated by three English letters. And these creatures come out once again. These exact same ones. The Bible's Antichrist is their Nadi. Who were here before. In Egypt, the Mayans, the Hunan. They are going to do similar things to what they have done in the past. Printed in 1948, pages 24 and 25. And that is convince the population that they are gods. They're related. They are a group of international elitists and this is the uh, CFR, the uh, Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, the CFR, and the Bilderberg Group, and others like this. In this video, we will address the substitute antichrists proposed by the counter-reformationists who want the world's religion synthesized into one, under the control of the Vatican, and show why they are all based on various attempts at fraud in dealing with biblical texts. What is important for the viewer to realize however, is that the things they will be shown, are nothing new, and are already known by the very people spreading these decoy antichrists. In fact, this is the material that they intentionally hide from their audiences in order to persuade them away from the biblical definition. Yes, that is correct. They actually know and intentionally hide the information you are about to see. Thus, that is why it must be admitted 
that these kinds of quote Christian unquote leaders are actually liars. Anyone can make an honest mistake. But when you intentionally hide information in order to promote false claims, then it is no longer either honest or a mistake. It becomes an intentional act of deceit. And as shocking as this may be to many Christians, it is true nevertheless. Bold-faced intentional liars who are lying in the name of religion are not telling you anything about the Antichrist. They are actually telling you lies in order to hide him. First myth that has to be dispelled is that the Antichrist is a non-Christian. This is perhaps the most popular myth that is spread by the counter-reformationists. It is naturally popular with all Christians because it takes the suspicion of the label away from Christians and scapegoats it onto some unpopular group or threatening development. It's much easier to see enemies of Christianity, who often even openly boast of their fondness for things that are anti-Christian, as antichrist. This confusion is caused by not really knowing the content of biblical texts on that subject, and by the way that the English prefix anti is used in common language. In English the prefix anti denotes opposition or conflict. But the use of the term in Greek carried a different connotation. It did not mean opposition in the same sense that we have in English today, because in the Koine Greek of the New Testament, the prefix anti included the idea of replacement and substitution. The Antichrist is someone who replaces or substitutes Christ with their own authority, but they do so, in his name, claiming to do so, on his behalf. So that fact along with scores of other texts, makes it very clear, the biblical authors were intending to communicate, the Antichrist, would be found among Christians, not openly fighting them, as an openly declared opponent to them. No one is ever, quote, deceived, end quote, by an open opponent. And this is a fact, that every counter-reformationist, leader, knows. For over a thousand years, the subject of the Antichrist was debated, discussed, and scrupulously studied, in Western civilization, by people who were personally fluent in biblical languages. It wasn't until the Counter-Reformation came along to intentionally confuse Christians over the subject, that Christians ever, considered, the Antichrist to be anything other, than a Christian. It was known, universally, among Christians even in the Roman Catholic Church, that the Antichrist was clearly of the Christian religion. Why was there such consensus over that topic, on what religion, the Antichrist would be? Because the texts in the scripture make it very clear, to Christians, that that is the case. The warnings are all given to Christians, and they are warned, not to fall for the deception, as Christians. In fact, the descriptions are so clear in this regard, only intentional deception can do away with them. And so, that is precisely what the counter-reformationists, decided to do. So, when you hear that a Muslim leader, or an atheist, or a secular communist, or a Jew, etc., is the Antichrist, you can know right then, immediately, what you are hearing, is a counter-reformationist passing on a big lie to you. They may not personally know themselves, but you can be certain that their leaders do. Any theological school that has so much as even a library, will expose any theologically trained leader to this fact, more times than they will even be able to count. In fact, you have to consciously make up a number of very long and very contorted excuses to ignore all of it, because it is so replete and continuously repetitive throughout all theological literature, no matter what their theological denomination is. Precisely because, it was a universal consensus among virtually all Christians. And that consensus was there precisely because it is that obvious and non-negotiable in the biblical texts authored by the apostles themselves. And if you think there is any confusion over this fact, you are simply in denial. The texts in the scripture are so explicit, they even mention the doctrine of God, held and promoted by the Antichrist. And it is a remarkable prophetic reference, that singles out only one religion, on earth, unmistakably. The people who wrote the New Testament were Jewish. The most central doctrine to the Jewish faith was monotheism. This fact is not only cited by Christ himself as well, the doctrine of historic Jewish monotheism was reaffirmed by him as the greatest commandment in all of the scriptures, which is a pretty amazing affirmation, considering most people today who claim to follow Christ, hold to a doctrine known as, Trinitarianism. Trinitarianism is unique to Christianity. It is not held by any other religion on earth. It is not held by Jews, it is not held by Muslims, it is not held by Buddhists, and it is certainly not held by atheists. Trinitarianism, however, did not exist when the New Testament was written. It was developed by Latin theologians, centuries after the time of Christ, and hundreds of years after the Apostles. 
but the Antichrist is described as promoting a doctrine of three unclean frog spirits which is embraced by the kings of the earth. The word, unclean, is the cognate for the Jewish concept of un, kosher. This sounds like a very strange phrase, to modern ears. Why are three unkosher frogs, mentioned? Unfortunately for the public, counter-reformationists hide basic historical information concerning the actual history of Christianity from their audiences because they do not want Christians finding out what has happened in history. One of the things that counter-reformationists inexcusably do is hide the history of the doctrine of the Trinity and insist on it without question or scrutiny. Because, after all, their goal as counter-reformationists is to work to return everyone to the Roman Catholic Church. And the Trinity is very much a uniquely Roman Catholic religious doctrine. It first arose in a text known as the Gospel of the Egyptians, which was considered a sacred text among Latin theologians, who were the forefathers of the Roman Catholic Church. This Egyptian text, known as the Gospel of the Egyptians, introduced the concept of the Trinity, describing it as the three Ogdodes. What are Ogdodes, you ask? That is a very odd word to modern Christians today, isn't it? But it was a term very well known to Egyptians. Ogdodes were depicted as frogs, and thought of as the primal reptilian spirits which created the world. Thus the three Ogdodes, mentioned in the creation of the Trinity doctrine, in the Gospel of the Egyptians, was in fact, just as prophetically described, three unkosher frog spirits. This historical background to the Trinity, is intentionally hidden by counter-reformationists, because they do not want the public to know, where this doctrine came from, or that it was actually prophesied in the scripture, as a doctrine which would identify, the Antichrist, to Christians. Naturally, if you know that the Antichrist is going to be a Trinitarian, it makes it very difficult to claim he is a Muslim or a Jew or an atheist or a secular communist. So that historical fact, is hidden from their audiences. No matter what you think of the Trinity Doctrine personally, you need to know as a Christian, the Biblical Antichrist is without a doubt, a Trinitarian. And once again, unmistakably, found among Christians. Not Jews, Muslims, Atheists, or Secularists. If you hear someone tell you that the Antichrist is a Muslim, ask yourself, are Muslims, Trinitarians? If the answer is no, then you can be assured that no Muslim will ever be the Antichrist, no matter how many Christians they may slaughter, butcher, defame, persecute, or murder. While Muslim imperialists may be very bad, and savagely evil and violent, that does not make them, the Antichrist. In fact, the Islamic Empire was at its peak historically, and invading all of Europe, various rogue Islamic warriors and caliphate assassins, were committing many of the same kind of horrific acts of violence that we see today. Yet even in the face of all this, when Europe was on the verge of collapse itself from Islam, virtually all Christian biblical theologians and scholars, were unanimous in their recognition, that the Antichrist was without any doubt, someone of the Christian religious persuasion. Not a Muslim, nor even a Jew. Because neither of these groups or ideologies are, Trinitarians. Another item that counter-reformationists hide from their audiences, are the rather graphic descriptions of the followers of the Antichrist, given in the New Testament. The theological descriptions of the people who follow the Antichrist, clearly show them to be not atheists, secularists, Jews or Muslims, but Christians. People who consider themselves to be followers of Christ, despite the fact, they are actually followers of the Antichrist. Counter-Reformationists like to portray the picture that the Antichrist is one man only, who will come in the future only, and only after all the Christians on earth have magically disappeared in a rapture, so that they can avoid a seven-year tribulation period. Of course, if you examine the texts in the Bible, you will discover there is a mathematical proof that shows rapture theology is a false claim based on nothing more than the math itself. What every counter-reformationist knows and hides from his audience, is that Christ made a very clear statement concerning the future of his own movement. It is recorded in Matthew chapter 7. He explicitly tells his disciples the following. Quote, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, 
Have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The people Christ is describing in the future are clearly people who consider themselves his followers. They call him Lord four times in the text with double emphasis, which is the Greek term master. And they are doing uniquely Christian things. They are doing exorcisms in his name, they are prophesying things in his name, and they are doing many charitable works in his name. Jews and Muslims and atheists are not particularly known for doing exorcisms, and certainly not running around doing them in the name of Christ. And you will not find Islamic jihadists anywhere on earth, known for all their charitable works in Christ's name. In fact, there are none done in Christ's name. The same is true of Jews and Muslims and atheists or even secularists or quote, liberals. The only people doing many charitable works in Christ's name are obviously none other than Christians who are also the only ones who call him Lord. But what is amazing about this text is what it says about these same people. Normally, when you are starting a movement, the last thing you want to do is insult your future followers, but what we have here is not just an insult but a full denunciation of them. He doesn't just call them bad people, or hypocrites, he makes the astounding claim that they will not even be saved by his atonement on the cross. As any counter-reformation Christian theologian will be more than happy to tell you, if you accept Christ as your personal savior, and put your faith in his atonement for your sins, then you are what they call born again, and will certainly be going to heaven, end of story. And if you don't buy that explanation, you are of the devil, or are teaching salvation by works, and are not saved by grace, unless you are Roman Catholic, in which case, you enjoy a special dispensational exception, for political and economic reasons. And long before any Antichrist shows up on earth, you will be magically raptured, along with the Pope, into heaven, to be with Christ. And yet, they make these claims, knowing all along those ideas, are flatly repudiated and denounced by Christ's own words in Matthew 7. But the text in Matthew 7 in the original language, gets even more graphic in its denunciations, than what is shown in the English translation. In the English translation, we see that he said many will falsely call him Lord. But the Greek word, for, many, used there, is the word polus. And it doesn't just mean many, as we see in the English translation. Many is a relative term. It can range from a few to a whole lot, relative to the number you are discussing, but the Greek term polus means explicitly, most. The vast majority of, well beyond 49 or 50 percent. It means the vast common state. Christ is using that term to describe people in the future who will call him Lord, Lord. And yet he says, he will say to them, depart from me, I never even knew you. And likewise, they never even knew him. The only problem is, they never realized they never knew him. And the expression, in that day, is an eschatological reference to the Great Judgment Day, the final sum, of all things, Christian, that ever existed on earth, in history. Not one particular, bad hair day. The sum total of Christianity on earth, and the sum total of all the Christians on earth who repeatedly call Christ, Lord, with emphasis, will be that the overwhelming vast majority, he says he will curtly dismiss. Straight for damnation. That is an amazing statement, and it certainly flatly contradicts everything counter-reformationists are telling people, or even hinting at. In fact, they are not telling people this message at all. Why not? The answer to that question is very clear, because they are precisely the very same people Christ is describing in that prophecy. And their claims about all these Christians disappearing in the rapture, long before there is an antichrist, are also repudiated in this text as well. And here is how. It is a matter of sheer math. Christ makes it very clear, and explicitly so, that the majority of Christians, the common definition of what is meant by the term Christian, and what they commonly mean when they call him Lord, Lord, will be in fact, nothing more than a deception. If you look up religious demographics on the internet from any number of religious databases available on the subject, you will discover that the largest Christian group on earth by far, is Roman Catholicism. In fact, Roman Catholicism even outnumbers all other Christian churches and Christian belief systems on earth, combined. 
because many counter-reformationists are driven also by money, they know they cannot build their mega churches and their TV ratings by saying anything negative about the largest population of Christians on earth. They would lose both. So they bend over backwards to be ecumenical with Rome's Catholicism, while they will hypocritically condemn other religious minority groups, guilty of much less than the Vatican, both in terms of unethical behaviors, or some alleged heresy. They will do this, all along knowing, that they are flagrantly contradicting the contents of Matthew 7. And they also know that when they tell these audiences that all these Christians are going to heaven simply because they called him Lord, and that there is no Antichrist on earth until they all get raptured, that they are openly denying what Christ said about them. What they are telling you in the public is a very, very, very dangerous lie. If the Antichrist is only one man at the end of time, that just shows up, after all the Christians have been raptured, then you are claiming the exact opposite mathematically, from what Christ says in this text. And here is the math that proves it. The global population since the time of Christ beginning at 1 AD is estimated to be about 20 and a quarter people. 31% of that total can be extrapolated to be, or have been, Christian. 31% would be around 6 and a quarter billion people. There are 131 million additions to the population per year, so if all the Christians were removed, and this text referred only to false Christians who followed the Antichrist during the seven-year tribulation period, you would at most, only be talking about 284 million false apostate Christians, who fit into Matthew 7. That is only 5% of the population of Christians 5%. That is certainly not anywhere even near what Christ described as the vast majority. And that's before you minus any out for the actual rapture itself. If you minus out half for the rapture, then you are at only 0.022% and you have managed to turn Christ into a liar. So, you see, the math itself concerning the counter-reformationist view of history and religion with regard to the Antichrist and a rapture does not add up. And it is clear from Matthew 7, that the counter-reformationists' religious leaders, are precisely the people, Christ was warning about in his prophecy. And if you are following Christ, yet that isn't Christ? Then what, are you following? Remember, that the Greek term NT, includes the idea of substitution and replacement. It is very clear Christ was prophesying that a large majority of future Christians would be following and believing in a substitute Christ that would not be him, and that is clearly by its very definition, the Christian religious constituency of the Antichrist. The false Christ. The substitute Christ. And you can those those figures mathematically, with just a fictional rapture, and seven years of bad luck for bad people. Another important clue in the text in Matthew 7 that Christ was referring uniquely to Christians and not Muslims or Jews or some other group, is the reason he gives for dismissing them from his presence, even though they are repeatedly calling him Lord, Lord. It is over the issue of the definition of God. As you saw earlier, Christ said that the greatest commandment in the scripture was that God was one. And he said that no other commandment was greater than this, and that it was the first of all the commandments. Counter-Reformationist Trinitarian Christians like to point out that even though Christ said that, they are under no obligation to honor his instruction concerning the doctrine of God, known as the Shema, because after all as they put it, we are no longer under the law. And while the New Testament was very explicit concerning the coming doom of the Levitical law within the context of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, they never extended those comments to the doctrine of God itself or any of the other elements of moral and religious law, found throughout the Torah and reiterated by the apostles themselves, as part of the renewed covenant. The reason Christ gives for dismissing them for damnation, the text says, is because they were, quote, workers of iniquity, quote, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Matthew chapter 7 verse 23. When you look up the term, iniquity, in Greek, you will discover it is the word anomia, and means to reject the Jewish law. And what was the greatest commandment in the Jewish law, according to Christ? It was the Shema, Hear O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And what was the prophesied deity of the Antichrist? It was the three Ogdodes of Trinitarianism. 
And once again, this points to the religious constituency of the Antichrist, who enforced Trinitarianism on all Christendom through violence, and whose followers make up the majority of history's Christians who call Christ Lord, Lord, but in reality are practicing an open rejection of the greatest commandment in the scriptures that Christ himself reiterated, along with the threat of damnation. And this rejection is causing them to end up following a false Christ, which will not save anyone, but will mislead them into damnation as followers of the Antichrist. As anyone knows, you cannot be a Roman Catholic unless you embrace Rome's Trinity. But this is not the only warning we have concerning the followers of the Antichrist, which clearly show this was not limited to some imaginary seven-year period. After all, the Christians on Earth become magically raptured. In the previous two examples, you have seen how the Counter-Reformation is intentionally hiding, and even lying to, to the public in order to cover up, the identity of not only the followers of the Antichrist, but even the doctrine of God, which clearly identifies the teaching of the Antichrist. In this section, you will discover, another thing that Counter-Reformationists are lying about, in order to hide, when it comes to their fraudulent use of the term, the Antichrist. And that is that the New Testament, even clearly describes the clergy of the Antichrist. Not only does it describe the doctrine of God required by the Antichrist, not only does it describe the masses of Christian followers who will be deceived by the Antichrist, it even specifically and unmistakably describes the very clergy of the Antichrist, as well. And as you will see, there is no mistaking who these ancient texts are clearly pointing to. It is not Muslims, Jews, Bilderbergers, Council on Foreign Relations, the UN, half-breed humans from outer space, reptiles, or American presidents or politicians. First Timothy is written to by Paul instructing a protege on how to be a good minister or servant to the New Testament community of households of faith. How to function in the role and in the work of ministry. The context of this text is the ministry itself. In addressing Timothy's questions and giving him instructions, Paul brings up the issue of the apostasy again by way of a contrast, to mention the rise of a counter-clergy among the coming apostasy. The clergy of the Antichrist are called demonic hypocrites, which is obviously a very strong denunciation, just like we saw with Christ earlier, using extremely graphic language. Paul writes the following. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, or until thou hast attained. Paul says, by way of contrast to being a good minister, these ministers will depart from the faith. What faith is Paul describing here? It is more than obvious, he is referring to the faith that him and Timothy share. Here is something that every counter-reformationist professional liar and disinformationist fully knows. Paul is not discussing the Islamic faith, nor is he discussing atheism or some other future group. Nor is he discussing godless liberal secularism, the Bilderberg Group, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Islamic Caliphate, the Islamic Mahdi, an American president rock stars, a rich business mogul, or half-human Martians from outer space. He is discussing people who will fall away from the New Testament faith. He is discussing a group of Christian ministers or clergy who are apostate. The term seducing, in the phrase, giving heed to seducing spirits, is the Greek word, planos. And it is defined in Greek concordances as meaning, to rove as a tramp would do, that is, by implication an imposter or misleader, a deceiver, seducing. It carries the connotation of a type of sexual seduction. Seduction occurs not in the context of open conflict and opposition, but in secrecy and privacy, through flattery and false agreements and assurances, pleasantry, 
that would certainly rule out Islamic jihadists. He says they end up teaching doctrines of devils. This is the same phrase that is used in Revelation concerning the three unclean frogs which are called the spirit of devils which go out to the kings of the earth, as you saw earlier. He then makes the astounding claim that these Christian ministers will speak lies and hypocrisy. In other words, openly use intentional deceit or propaganda as a religious method to spread their doctrines, and says they will have their conscience seared as with a hot iron. The term used there means to be branded as cattle are, and the result is a death to your own conscience. He gives two things that they will do in order to identify them. One is to forbid marriage among themselves as clergy, and the other is to practice vegetarianism. Paul is clearly describing the practices of asceticism. If you look into the real history of the founding of the Roman Catholic Church, you will discover that a group of celibates known as the Desert Fathers from Egypt were very instrumental in the formation of the doctrines in the Roman Catholic Church. The Desert Fathers, as they are called, were the founders of the monastery movement, and they practiced asceticism, precisely as this text describes, including both vegetarianism and celibacy. They were also the same community responsible for the Gospel of the Egyptians, you saw earlier, and the three Ogdodes of Trinitarianism. So it is clear in history who Paul was referring to here. They are not Muslims, Jews, Bill Dabergers, American presidents, Martians from outer space, or ancient centaurs and satyrs from the mythological Tartarus. They are Christian ministers who call Christ Lord, teach doctrines concerning Ogdodes and who practice celibacy. Paul says that marriage would be forbidden among them. Celibacy is still forbidden to this day among the clergy of the Roman Catholic Church, and it is only major religious body in the world that observes this practice, so it is very disingenuous for counter-reformationists to pretend they don't know what this is referring to today, or that any of this has anything to do with Muslims, Jews, presidents, business moguls, or Martians, which of course the counter-reformationist is already fully aware. But as the text suggests, among this group, lying is an acceptable method of spreading their control, which in the end, is no different than any common witchcraft. It is not accidental that both Catholic saints, Ignatius Loyola and John Chrysostom promoted the utilitarian use of deceit by the Church to spread their religious doctrines. The use of intentional deceit and propaganda in its most negative sense was so important to the Roman Catholic Church, they founded an entire office responsible for conducting of it called the Sacred Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith. Propaganda Fide. The unique practice of celibacy, clearly connects only one entity in the world, to this text historically. And it is by no accident, the same entity that is also connected to the three Ogdodes from Egypt, and also happens to be the majority of Christianity on earth, who call Christ, Lord, but openly reject, what he said, for something else, they call Christ, in his place. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul is addressing a confusion over eschatology which was breaking out among some households of faith in Thessalonica. It was the idea that the day of Christ was at hand. It was all about to end. Paul corrects this claim by pointing to a well-known prophecy among the Thessalonians that Paul himself had taught them on. Thus, why he brings it up and appeals to it to disprove the claim that the day of Christ was already at hand. Paul writes, Be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not, that, when I was yet with you, I told you these things? This prophecy was of particular importance to the Thessalonians, because Paul had told the Thessalonians it would be in their very city, that the Antichrist, whom he labels, the man of sin and son of perdition, would be revealed. And the thing that would identify him to the Thessalonians, would be that he would claim all authority over everything religious, 
including their own faith. He says this would be done by way of an authoritative official order or proclamation and that he would speak as God from his chair of authority, which is a throne. And he says that that exaltation would take place as it says in the Greek, eyes, tone, neon, to, the, u. This phrase is translated, the temple of God, which counter-reformationists always immediately claim is the physical temple in Jerusalem. The problem, of course, is that, there is no temple, in Jerusalem. So they remedy that obvious problem, by simply claiming, there will be one, one day. In other words, they simply employ circular reasoning. But Paul never once uses this term elsewhere to refer to the physical temple in Jerusalem. He always, without exception, always uses this specific term, to refer to the people, of the Christian faith. He does this in the New Testament without a single exception. Not even once. Secondly, there is no throne in a Jewish temple. There were in Gentile temples, usually occupied by a hollow statue of the god, in which the priest would climb up into and speak to an audience. But this convention is not Jewish. And Jews would never allow a Jewish temple to be profaned in that way. They would precisely as they have done in the past literally die, attempting to kill anyone who would desecrate their temple in that manner. And the third problem is, that there will never be another Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Unless you genocide one third of the human population that is Muslim first. And that is simply not going to happen, no matter what anyone tells you. Most modern Jews today, even in Israel, have rearranged their entire religious rabbinical practice and even its theology, around the absence of a physical temple in Jerusalem and really could care less if one was ever rebuilt or not. In fact, centuries of rabbinical sermons in practice, would have to be literally thrown away, if one were rebuilt. Modern rabbis have taught for centuries now, that a blood sacrifice was useless and not necessary. Many modern Jews would find the spectacle of a constant stream of blood, from slaughtered animal sacrifices, frightfully primitive, disgusting and appalling. Support for these kinds of religious fantasies in modern Israel, are found among fringe Jewish religious extremists groups, and no one else. <laughs> Counter-Reformationists are simply fantasizing about a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem because they are left with no other explanation, other than the Antichrist has already come, and the Temple of God, Paul was referring to in 2 Thessalonians, was just like every other time he used the phrase in the New Testament, to blatantly, obviously and consistently refer, to the people themselves, who claim to follow Christ, not a pile of bricks in Jerusalem, he along with Christ, had called condemned as a dead carcass, and destined to perish. Even John, in his vision of the kingdom of God on earth, when writing about the coming of the new Jerusalem, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 10 and 22, very clearly and openly states, quote, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, and I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty, and the Lamb, are the temple of it. John saw no future temple in Jerusalem. And Paul's use of that term is always, without a single exception to the contrary, a reference to Christians. It is clear, when read in historical context, Paul was warning the Thessalonian Christians, about the coming of an attempt by Rome, to claim authority over their faith, among Christians. And Paul warns them, because he also notes, that many so-called Christians, will be deceived by this deception. And if all this were not already obvious enough, he refers to the entire event prophetically in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, as an apostasia, translated as, a falling away, once again, another direct reference, to the Christian faith. Not Bilderbergers, atheists, communists, Martians or Muslims, who never had any connection to the Christian faith, to begin with. Paul says the man of sin will come directly out of the apostasy, and that is the same apostasy he spoke to Timothy about describing the clergy as forbidding marriage, and practicing the utilitarian use of intentional deceit, in order to spread their doctrines. Everyone, including counter-reformationist liars, fully know, what is meant by the term apostasy. If you see someone pointing to an antichrist, and it is not something or something that has fallen from the Christian faith, then you are not looking at the antichrist, no matter how bad they may be. The man of sin, is someone who is part of the great apostasy from the New Testament faith. He is an imposter Christian, who is found among Christians, and speaks as God, over their faith, from a throne.
Will this happen in the future? No. Absolutely not. How do you know? Because it has already happened. This prophecy has already been fulfilled, and thus, can no longer be fulfilled in the future. If it happens again, it's not doing anything, that is not already, the normative state of events. So its occurrence now, would not be prophetic in any way. It would be like prophesying, the Ford Motor Company, is very soon, going to invent a car. If you said that seriously, people would laugh you out of the room, think you were telling a joke, and if they realized you were serious, they would conclude you were crazy. And the only reason that doesn't happen over 2 Thessalonians, is because the history of what happened in this very city, is suppressed and hidden, by counter-reformationists, who are intentionally lying to the public, and hiding the history of Western civilization from Christians. The most important event in Western civilization and possibly the world, occurred right here in the city of Thessalonica, precisely as Paul prophesied it would. And it even bore the name of this very city. It was called the Edict of Thessalonica, and in it Rome declared absolute authority over all religion in the world, under the authority of Rome's Pontifex Maximus, also known as the Roman Pope. It threatened punishment against all dissenters and the confiscation of both the personal wealth and the property of all churches in the empire. And any minister of any churches in the empire, with death or imprisonment, if refused. Shortly afterwards, over 7,000 protestors were slaughtered in the streets of Thessalonica like animals. And Rome has lied about the events of that massacre ever since it happened, and continues to lie about it, all the way up into our very own day. The name of the Pope, emerging from the Council of Ephesus, who approved of that slaughter was Pope Sixtus III, which is Latin for Sixth Three. Literally, Six, Six, Six. Can this prophecy be fulfilled today? No. This text is no longer a prophecy. It's already happened. And anyone that hides this information from the public is simply another counter-reformationist liar, you should not even be listening to. Any more, than if you should be asking some trailer park, Nazi, in rural Mississippi, about the Holocaust. Make sure and watch part 2, to learn how the term Antichrist was coined in apostolic times, and what it actually, really, referred to. Or, how the signs of the Antichrist in the book of Revelation, have been fulfilled in history, and point unmistakably once again, to precisely, what the Counter-Reformation hides, from the public. All this and more, will be covered in, The Antichrist for Dummies, part 2. Thank you for watching.